Hello, I'm Pastor Brian from Charlestown Baptist Church. We invite you to come and join us as the church gathers for worship. But until then, we put our sermons on video so that we can be a ministry to you and your family wherever you are. God bless you. After the Beatles broke up in 1970, George Harrison and Ringo Starr got together and worked out a song that became Ringo Starr's first solo hit. And it was recorded in 19, or released in 1971. It got a lot of airplay on the radio, and you still hear it sometimes today. And Ringo sang the lyrics, you've got to pay your dues if you want to sing the blues, and you know it don't come easy. You don't have to shout or to leap about, but you know it don't come easy. And that song has endured because whatever it is you're doing, sometimes it really doesn't come easy, does it? Sometimes it's downright hard. Most of the things that are worth doing in life are going to be difficult. What noble or worthy goal have you sought that has not required some kind of sacrifice or hard work or been filled with challenge. It doesn't come easy. And sometimes the best things in life are the hardest. Build a business. Raise a family. Get an education. Climb Mount Everest. Whatever it is. It's hard. So many people set out to accomplish those things and they bail out and they quit halfway through because it's not easy. It's difficult and there's challenge in life. We could consider the internal things, the soul work that we need to do, reconcile your past mistakes, make amends, deal with grief, sort out your own dysfunction and pathologies, forgive the people who have hurt you. That stuff makes climbing Mount Everest sound easy. It's hard. We work those things out. It's noble and worthy cause. Consider this faith that we talk about. Walking in faith. Growing in grace. Spiritual maturity. Growing a gracious and godly soul. It's a worthy and noble and important goal. And it will not just happen. It requires some things of us. And those things are often very difficult. And yet we do them. This morning we're going to look at six or seven factors, some difficult things that the Lord puts on us that are necessary in us to grow that strong and gracious soul. We're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 2, if you'd like to turn there in your Bible. Paul is writing some words of encouragement to his young protege, Timothy. Paul's in prison under the sentence of death for the preaching of the gospel. Timothy had been part of Paul's ministry team for many years. They'd worked and served and traveled together. And now Timothy is serving as the pastor at the church in Ephesus. And so these words are written to a pastor, but they apply to all of us who know and serve and honor the Lord Jesus. 2 Timothy chapter 2, would you stand please to honor the reading of God's holy word. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also... If anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer must be the first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Father God, we do seek understanding in these matters, and I pray you'd speak to us. Help us to see the challenge that lays before us. Prepare us, God, to take on the difficult tasks of honoring you and growing in your grace. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. And be seated, please. 
This chapter starts off in uh, verse 1 with the words, To be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Certainly, strength is a quality that we admire. Strength of character, strength of soul. We all honor that. We all seek that. But one of the great paradoxes of Scripture is, it's not our strength not our strength at all. It's the strength of God. It doesn't come from within. It comes from above. Elsewhere in Scripture, the Apostle Paul wrote about the thorn in his flesh. And there's been a lot of debate about what that was. Uh, some people say he might have had vision trouble, blindness, or whatever. doesn't matter. But he prayed and he sought that the Lord would remove that from him and restore him. But God chose to let Paul keep that thorn, and Paul was humbled by it. And the Lord spoke to him in that circumstance and said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. As we practice and experience humility, as we deny the self, as we kill off pride and ego, that powerful presence of God raises us up and strengthens us. And we find a true and enduring kind of strength. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus means I'm not going to find my own place and position that I would not try to act in my own will and willpower, but rather by the strength of God. On the night the Lord was betrayed in the upper room, the Last Supper, Jesus was warning them of the things to come. And he warned that all will be made to stumble this very night. Peter, good old Peter, spoke up with boldness and said, Lord, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And that's a prime example of someone acting in their own strength, acting in their own audacity and boldness. We think we can do it all. We think we've got it all put together. We're going to go the distance no matter what. Well, we know what happened to Peter. And before the sun came up the next morning, all that confidence and all that courage and all that boldness was just gone. Find your strength in God and humble yourself before Him and let His strength be that which sustains you. And I remind you that God will resist the proud. He gives strength and grace to the humble. Paul's second word comes in verse 2. Simply tell the story. It's part and parcel of the gospel that we tell the story. That we give testimony to what God is doing and what God has done. That we speak these words of grace and truth. In this verse, Paul is encouraging Timothy not only to tell, but tell to the right people. Tell to faithful men. Tell to people of integrity who will then go forward and tell it again and again. And there's a lot in here about leadership development and the multiplication of ministry and how we can expand the net. That'll wait for another day. The point I want to make right here is simply tell the story. Go ye therefore, make disciples. Teach them, baptize them, and know that God is with you when you do that. That's how the gospel is going to go forward. People like you and I, tell the story. Tell the story. And you know, you don't need a seminary degree to tell the story. You don't need to be the preacher to be the one that tells the story. You don't need to have all the answers to anything the Bible says about everything. You just need to tell the story. You may not be an expert in theology. You may not be an expert in the Bible. But I guarantee you there is one bit of biblical doctrine that you know better than anybody else in the whole world. There is one component of the kingdom of God that you know better than anybody. What has God done for you? What has God done in your life? You are the world's leading expert in that. And you've got a testimony. And if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, God has done something in your life, and it's a story worth 
telling. And if you don't tell it, who can? Tell the story. Tell the story of what God has done in you. It's yours to tell. The gospel is not something we keep for ourselves. It is something that must be shared. It must be given away. It must be passed on to the others. And Paul indicates in verse 3 that when we do that, there may in fact be some hardship and there may be some difficulty and you will be required to persevere. When we find our strength in the Lord and not in the self, well, that's not what the world is expecting. When we say it is God who has blessed me, it is God who has strengthened me and changed me, that's not what the crowd wants to hear. And so they might stand against you. When you live for Christ each day and every day, the world will be opposed. It's part of it. It's okay. I think I said it last week. Surely they hated Jesus. They hated him so much, they got him killed. Do you think all of a sudden they're going to change their tune and start liking us? We will always be swimming against the tide, and it's okay. These verses that Paul uses to compare the Christian life to that of a soldier speak to me personally, and I suspect they're very close to home for anybody that served in the armed forces. Because if you've ever been in uniform, you know, sometimes you just got to suck it up and do it. And there's just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It takes me back to days of being cold and wet and tired and hungry and having a nigh-on impossible task before me. It takes me back to times where lives were in the balance, counting on me to do my job right and well and right now. And I would much rather be laying on a beach somewhere, but you do it because it's got to be done. My friends, you're going to endure hardship. It is part and parcel of the gospel. You can expect it. As you grow in grace, you can learn to live in it. And you can accustom yourself to hardship, and you can overcome, and you can endure, and you can persevere, and God will be honored. Let nothing hinder the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let nothing stand in the way of the message of grace and mercy and peace. We must persevere. We must endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ. Because our first loyalty, our first priority, is to Him. Because He's the one that called us. And we are part of His kingdom. We are in the world, but not of the world. We live in the kingdom of the world, but we belong to the kingdom of God. That's where our loyalty lies. We have a higher purpose, and we have a higher mission than the affairs of the daily mess in which we live. So we don't get bound up, and we don't get dragged down, and we don't get stressed out by the ups and downs of the world. We hold fast to the Lord Jesus. Amen? Parallel verses, Romans 12, 2. Don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. To be literally translated, that would say, don't be conformed to the pattern that this world wants to put on you. Don't be pressed into the mold of the world, but rather let the power of God shape you mold you and grow you, be transformed to Christ. Our loyalty, our services do him and not the crowds that gather around or fail to gather around. Another pop music reference fits in here very well. 1981, a band called 38 Special, some of you remember them. They sang a song called Hold On Loosely and Don't Let Go. And if you cling too tightly, you're going to lose control. Remember that one? Hold on loosely to this world. Don't grip onto the world because it's going to drag you down. Hold loosely to the things of this world. Hold tight to God. Hold tight to the power of Jesus Christ. 
That's where our peace, that's where our strength will come. We've got to focus on the Lord and Him alone. And you know the thing about focusing on God? It requires our focus. It requires our constant attention. It requires that daily discipline of reminding ourselves it's all about what God is doing and what God desires for me. You see, God speaks in a still, small voice. And the world climbs up and shouts in your face and screams, Hey, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. So it's easy for us to get drawn away by the world. It's easy for our attention to waver. Hold loosely to the world. Seek the Lord. Cling to Him. So we persevere and we focus. And in verse 5, we discipline ourselves. Paul changes from the soldier to the athlete. If anyone competes in athletics, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The athlete focuses on the task, on the event, on the game, on the sport, on the whatever it is. And he trains and he trains and he trains for it. And he learns and he studies the game. And he has a game plan. And he devotes himself to the task and he gives his best effort and there's no shortcuts, and there's no cheat days, and there's no time off, and it is a single-minded focus. There's physical discipline in the exercise, in the training, in the diet. There's, there's the mental discipline to do those things even when it's inconvenient. Deny the flesh to have mastery over oneself. What a blessing. And all of that within the boundaries of doing what is right, morally, ethically, legally. You see the trend today in professional sports, the performance-enhancing drugs, the steroids, the human growth hormone, whatever it is. And when those players get caught, they get a fine, which usually means nothing to them because they make way too much money anyhow. But then they get suspended and they can't play. And then they get their titles stripped away from them and they're no longer the champion that they uh, presented themselves to be. Because cheaters never win. And there are no shortcuts to excellence. We are called to the disciplined life that does good and that does right in a continual pattern, in a constancy, so that we can grow strong. It's not easy. It's difficult. It's challenging but it's right. From soldier to athlete, and then in verse 6, to the farmer. The hard-working farmer must be the first to partake of the crops. We persevere, we focus, we discipline ourselves, and then we got hard work to do. How many of you grew up on a farm? Is there hard work on the farm? Yeah, there is hard work to be done all the time. I had a friend down in Louisiana. He had 600 acres and he grew rice and crawfish. And there was work to be done every day, all day. And it never stopped. Constant motion. Every year he invested everything he had to seed, to fertilizer, to equipment, to machinery. And he worked hard all summer. And you get paid once a year. It's tough going. Think about farming. Think about all the rest of life, for that matter. You got to make the investment before you get the reward. You've got to invest the labor, the time, the effort, the energy. And then later on comes the reward. You plant in the spring, you work hard all summer, and then comes the harvest in the fall, and you, hey, there comes the reward. And then after the harvest, you've got several more months of hard work getting ready for spring. The labor must come. You don't get the reward before you make the investment. You've got to be not afraid to work. We must labor for the kingdom with patience and perseverance, and then comes the reward at whatever the appropriate time. And for so much of our kingdom work, the reward won't come until after the ultimate harvest 
at the end of the ages. But we don't grow weary while doing good because we know that in due season we will reap a harvest if we don't lose heart. Amen? In verse 7, Paul gives us a summary thought. Consider what I've said. Consider what we've said about the soldier, the athlete, the farmer. Consider what we say about telling the story and facing, perse- and facing difficulty with perseverance. Consider what we say about discipline and labor and effort. Ponder it. Comprehend it. Accept it. None of these characteristics or traits are going to come easy. They don't just happen. Sometimes it's very, very hard. As we give ourselves to Christ, as we live for Him day by day, these things do come to us. And these traits will grow in us a powerful spirit of grace and love and mercy. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. And this is not merely an intellectual agreement that we know 3 plus 3 equals 6, as if it's some fact to agree with or disagree with. Understanding in the sense that we apprehend it, that we apply it to our lives, that we live it out day by day by day. My friends, nothing worth doing in life will come easy. It doesn't mean it's not worth it. It's always worth the effort. The best things are usually the hardest things, and they're worth the struggle. And through that struggle we grow, and there's no greater cause than the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. In a moment we're going to reflect and ponder and remember his sacrifice for us. The hardest thing ever done. The hardest task that any man took upon himself was to die on Calvary's cross for the sins of humanity. And we honor that today through the receiving of the elements of the Lord's table. Before we get there, we're going to take a moment and reflect and ponder and pray and have a moment of confession or whatever it is that you need to do between you and God. While we do that, we're going to sing a song of praise and the altar is open for whatever prayers are on your heart. Would you stand with us, please? Father God, we rejoice in you. I pray your blessings upon your people. I pray, Lord, that this time we would be drawn to you, and you, Lord, be honored in us. In Jesus' name, amen. My prayer that this sermon has been a blessing to you and that the Lord spoke to you through these words. We appreciate your participation. If we can be of ministry to you or your family, feel free to give us a call at the church office, 304-725-5917. We look forward to hearing from you. Until then, God bless you.